So now we will start looking at what is the basic minimum content in all the five basic requirements of your balance sheet. The standard India's one talks about says that at least these five contents should be there as a part of your financial statements. That is your balance sheet, your statement of profitability, statement of cash flow, statement of change in equity and your notes to accounts. In these five, except regarding the statement of cash flow, India's one talks about the basic minimum content to be presented. So let's see what is the basic minimum content to be presented. In presentation of financial statements, firstly, you need to offer, you need to follow an order of rigidity unless liquidity is a more realistic understanding of financial statements. What is the order of rigidity or rigidity preference method? A rigidity preference method always indicates that the most rigid asset or most illiquid asset should be presented first. What is the most illiquid asset? What do you mean by liquid or illiquid? Liquid assets are those which can be easily converted into cash. Illiquid assets are exactly the opposite where it takes substantial period to get converted into cash. So if I talk about the order of rigidity among the assets, then I will say first one is your land. Second is your building. Third is your machinery. Fourth is your furniture. Fifth is your vehicles and so on. Even among current assets, if I talk about you need to always start with inventory first and then go on with debtors, bills receivable and the last item to be presented which is the most liquid is cash in hand, right? And right above your cash in hand is your cash at bank, clear? So when you look at order of rigidity then I can put up like this saying that I will have to present the most illiquid asset first and the most liquid asset towards the end. That is rigidity preference method. As far as your liability is concerned, the first liability to be presented as order or in the order of rigidity is your long term loans. Long term loans is the first thing and going on you will have creditors and bank overdraft which is the most liquid liabilities. Clear? However, he is saying unless I will follow a rigidity preference method unless a liquidity basis is a more realistic understanding of financial statements. Then my question is, what is the case where liquidity basis is more realistic understanding? When does a financial statement of an enterprise be presented on liquidity preference method instead of rigidity preference method? This situation appears whenever the going concern of an, of an enterprise is affected. Let's say for example, there is a major fire accident which occurred. This is a classical example anyone would give whenever they talk about this concept of uh, you know the going concern being affected. The going concern is severely affected due to uh, a major fire accident which occurred. So what happened since the going concern is affected I don't expect the enterprise to run its operations but they expect to shut down the operation. When they have taken the decision to shut down in such cases rigidity preference method no longer is applicable. I'll have to present the financial statements under liquidity preference method where exactly reverse of the financial statements under rigidity preference method. That means the most liquid asset should be presented at the beginning and going forward to the last asset which is a most illiquid asset which is generally a land or a building. Clear? Now sir always major fire accident. Huh? Why can't there be any other case? Okay let's take any other case where the going concern is severely affected. Let's say I am into running a professional institute for education on CA, CMA and CS in a classroom environment. Due to Corona or due to COVID crisis, we have observed that running classroom uh, is absolutely not feasible. There was a huge amount of rent which I was incurring, huge administration cost which I was having. So what I finally decided was I cannot any longer run the operations in this manner. So I'm shut down the, I'm shutting down this enterprise and I'm starting a new enterprise which takes my education into an online mode like the one which we are communicating on. So in such cases the going concern of the previous entity which was running classrooms on a face to face basis are no longer in existence are not feasible to have any existence therefore the going concern is severely affected. In 2019 
the government of india has passed a rule saying that a bs4 vehicle is no longer eligible to be sold in the market is no longer eligible to be sold in the market after 31st of march 2020 so what happened let's say i have a machine which is manufacturing any component of a bs4 vehicle then in such cases if i can if i cannot modify the machine to suit a bs6 variant or that is pollution control norm variant then in such cases my going concern is also severely affected clear so there are multiple situations where the going concern of an enterprise is severely affected let's say for example i am into the uh, a retail store which imports from china furniture and i retail it here but subsequently due to whatever crisis that india had with china as a battle they have stopped all imports from china government has already passed an order stopping all imports from china so i cannot import any further material from china so what happened ultimately my going concern got severely affected because my business model itself was basically importing furniture from china and selling it into india so in such cases also a going concern can get affected this concept of going concern getting affected will also see as a part of india's 10 events occurring after balance sheet date clear so what am i saying as far as presentation of balance sheet is concerned it should always be presented on rigidity preference method unless liquidity is a more realistic understanding of financial statements clear now what is the basic minimum contents in the statement of balance sheet when i am presenting a balance sheet what is the basic minimum content the minimum content is divided into two categories assets equity and liabilities under assets i should at least show a classification of current and non current assets i should at least show a classification of current and non current assets same way as far as equity and liabilities is concerned i'll have to present at least three subcategories one is the shareholder funds which deals with share capital and reserves two is your non current liabilities third one being your current liabilities clear so these are the three important classifications which are minimum requirements as far as presentation of your balance sheet is concerned so as far as my content of balance sheet is concerned i'll have to present a current asset and non current assets within your assets and under your liabilities and equity i should present your shareholder funds your non current liabilities and current liabilities these are basic minimum contents in presentation of balance sheet can i present more you can present more because like i said in days one is only talking about minimum content now when i use the word current asset and current liability then the first question that will emerge in my head is what is a current asset what is a current liability if you remember in days 105 where we spoke about non current assets held for sale there we explained what is a non current asset with the help of using the definition of current asset from in days 1 so in days 1 is the primary place where the definition of current and non current is actually put up so let's see what is the definition of current assets and current liabilities non current assets and non current liabilities are not mentioned because non current assets and non current liabilities are other than current assets and other than current liabilities so what is a current asset what is a current liability you will come across one very very important use of a word called as operating cycle we will first understand what is an operating cycle and then we will start understanding what is the definition of current asset and current liability what is an operating cycle when i use the word operating cycle operating cycle is starting with purchase of raw material purchase of raw material going into the process of production
time taken for sale of finished goods time taken for realization from customer and this converts into cash such cash will again be used for purchase of raw material and so on this is called as an operating cycle so operating cycle is the time taken for purchase of raw material plus the time taken for conversion of a raw material into finished good time taken for sale of finished good time taken for realization from customers and finally getting converted into cash so this process or this entire cycle to complete how many days does it take is called as one operating cycle so every company has a different operating cycles look at companies like ratnadeep supermarkets look at companies which are into dmart so what happens avenue supermarkets is dmart so whenever we look at such kind of companies the operating cycles are genuinely small genuinely they have a very small operating cycle reason being these are fast moving goods but if i talk about industries like steel cement there's a significant amount of time because when i have to manufacture steel i'll have to basically get a ore so which is called as ignot ignot is the ore so ignot has to be mined and after mining this ignot it has to be put through a production process after entering into a production process we get special structures of steel this special structures of steel have to be advertised have to be marketed identify a customer and sell this product to the customer after the sale is done to the customer then happens your realization 90 day credit period 60 day credit period or sometimes cash and carry basis so and then we ultimately get cash so going round in this production process what is the time taken is basically called as an operating cycle in general sense i am not i am not standardizing anything i am just saying general sense operating cycle is always less than 12 months i am just generalizing it i am not saying that this is always compulsory i am just saying in general sense an operating cycle should fall within 12 months can it have more than 12 months yes sometimes it does happen but if i cannot identify operating cycle blindly i'll go with 12 months but sometimes there are enterprises where the operating cycles happen to be more than 12 months an enterprise which is into construction of public infrastructure like roads bridge etc it takes significantly more than 12 months let's say i am a real estate enterprise into development of residential housing it does take substantial period of time and it is definitely more than 12 months that is why i said it is not general concept i am not generalizing but i am just saying that some in most circumstances your operating cycles are shorter than 12 months clear now why is this concept of operating cycles even being coming up because in definition of current asset and current liability he will use this word operating cycle what is a current asset the asset is expected to be realized sold or consumed within an operating cycle then it can be considered as a current asset asset which can be sold inventory asset which can be realized is your debtors or bills receivable or advances assets which are consumed in the process which is raw material any such asset if it is expected to be sold or realized or consumed with an operating cycle it will be considered as a current asset debtors always current asset no sometimes you can have an offered credit period beyond 12 months let's say there is a contract which is going on and there is a retention period in the contract and you said out of every bill that you uh, give me i will hold 10% of the bill until the completion of the contract after the completion of the contract also after giving a defect free certificate 
then only these funds will be paid. Therefore, it takes more than an operating cycle to pay that amount. In such case, that portion of 10% of the data should be classified as non-current. So don't always come up with a logic saying that you will always have a data as a current asset, not necessary. So asset which are sold, expected or uh, sorry, realized or consumed during an operating cycle or within an operating cycle are current assets. Similarly, a current liabilities are expected to be transferred or settled within an operating cycle. Term loans are not expected to be settled within an operating cycle because term loan is for a period of seven years. But the installment of the term loan, which is expected to be falling due in the next 12 months, can be classified as current, as current liability. It's a seven year loan. At the end of first year, you need to understand in the second year, there is some payment which I have to do. Therefore, to the extent of the amount falling due in the next year, I can classify that as a current liability. While the remaining part of the term loan will be classified as non-current liability. So liabilities which are expected to be settled or transferred within an operating cycle should be considered as current liability. Assets which are primarily held for the purpose of trade or liabilities which are primarily held for the purpose of trade. What do you mean by trade? Buy and sell. Why did you get that asset? With the intention to buy or sell. For example, I have a bills receivable and I have a general tendency of discounting my bills. Discounting a bill is nothing but selling the bill to the bank. So that means it is an asset primarily held with the, with the purpose of trade. Same way I could have a liability also where I could factor a liability. I could give up a liability on today's date which I'll have to meet at a later point of time and today's date I'm settling it with a particular cash. That is liabilities held for trade. Cash and cash equivalents are always current assets and demand liabilities are always current liabilities. Cash and cash equivalents. What do you mean? Cash, cash in hand, cash at bank or any other very liquid investments which can be converted into a cash within 60 days. Any liquid investments which can be converted into cash within 60 days is called as a cash equivalent. Cash and cash equivalents are defined under India 7. A current liability includes a demand liability. What is a demand liability? There is no particular due date. You are required to pay the amount immediately when there is a demand. I demand you for payment today. You have to make the payment today. When will I demand my wish? I can demand current year. I can demand next year. I can demand after 10 years. Such kind of demand liabilities should also be considered as current liabilities only. Clear? A bearer check offered is a demand liability. It is supposed to be show, uh, realized or it is supposed to be settled immediately when the check is actually presented to us. Clear? Promissory notes payable on demand. So whenever I talk about current assets and current liabilities, I will define a current asset in three parts. An asset expected to be sold, realized or consumed within an operating cycle. An asset primarily held with the purpose of trade and cash and cash equivalents. Similarly, liability also defined in three parts. A liability which is expected to be settled or transferred within an operating cycle. Liabilities held primarily for the purpose of trade and a demand liability. These can be classified as current assets and current liabilities and non-current assets and non-current liabilities are any other items of assets and liabilities which cannot be classified under current assets and current liabilities. Clear? And that will bring us to the end of presentation of your financial statements and a balance sheet or the minimum content of a balance sheet where you present current assets and current liabilities along with equity uh, shareholder funds as a part of your liability and equities and your assets will have a current assets and non-current assets. That will bring us to the end of minimum requirements in presentation of balance sheet.
guys as far as your statement of profitability is concerned unlike what we have seen earlier under igap here under indias your statement of profitability is predominantly divided into two parts one is a statement of pnl and one is a statement of ocr both put together is called as total comprehensive income so certain items will go into the pnl and certain items will go into the ocr both put together is called as total comprehensive income which is tci so pnl plus oci is equal to tci clear now what is the statement of oci and why did this emerge where did we see oci earlier when we were discussing about india's 19 where we said there we said india's 19 actual actuarial gain or loss should be debited or credited to oci instead of pnl while current service cost interest cost return on plan assets, past service cost, curtailments, settlements, all these items are to be recognized within the statement of PNL itself. But only your actual gain or loss is one such item which goes into the OCI. Sir, any other items are there in the OCI? Any revaluation reserve which you create should be created out of the OCI itself. Any FCTR reserve in your India's 21 regarding your foreign currency translation reserve which emerges for your operations, foreign operations, is generally created out of your OCI. There are multiple items which can be transferred to OCI as far as India's 109 is concerned. When we discuss about financial instruments, we will discuss about that. So, OCI is rigid. OCI can only include certain items which are already specified by India's 1. You cannot have more items into OCI just because you wish or the management's wish to uh, classify them under OCI. So OCI is rigid, while PNL, any other item which should not be covered under OCI should be transferred to PNL. So your statement of profitability is divided into two parts, PNL and OCI. PNL plus OCI put together is called as total comprehensive incomes. Clear? PNL and OCI put together is total comprehensive income. There are certain minimum requirement, minimum contents in the in the PNL, but please remember that word minimum content is not applicable for OCI. Though I have written minimum content, it is contents of OCI which is rigid, fixed. But PNL has certain minimum contents: revenue from operations, non-operating income. What is a non-operating income? I have been into trade of furniture or steel, but I have certain fixed deposit on which I get interest. I got a tax refund in the previous year. So all these are non-operating incomes. Finance cost, which is your interest, uh, interest cost or borrowing cost as we have mentioned under India's 23. Impairment that we have studied under India's 36. Tax expense, which we have dealt under India's 12. A single amount attributable to discontinued operation, profit or loss from discontinued operation as dealt under India's 105. The share of profit I receive from a joint venture or an associate or a subsidiary. All these are basic minimum contents of PNL. These are basic minimum contents of PNL. Revenues from operation, all non operating incomes, finance cost impairments, tax expense, profit or loss from discontinued operation given in a single amount, share of profits from joint ventures, associates or subsidies. These are basic minimum contents in the PNL. Any other heading is possible? Yes. You can include as many headings as possible. Administration cost is generally one more heading. Man marketing cost is one more heading. Distribution cost is one more heading. Salaries is one more heading. So all these are also other headings, but at least these contents should be predominantly disclosed as a separate line items in the statement of PNL. But I come to OCI, revaluation surplus created as per India's 16, actuarial gain or loss as per India's 19, FCTR amount as per India's 21, or other items related to financial instruments which we will discuss under India's 109. Clear? These are the minimum contents to be presented in the statement of OCI. Both combined is basically giving my total comprehensive income.
what is your statement of changes in equity i skipped one statement what is that statement of cash flows because i said statement of cash flows is defined as per india 7 separate standard is already presented there therefore i'm skipping that i'll go into statement of changes in equity statement of changes in equity is a peculiarly new statement emerging as per india's because it requires you to present what is the total comprehensive income which emerged out of statement of profitability and any other retrospective changes which affect the retained earnings resulting from change in accounting policy or errors which we will deal under India's 8. In the India's 8, the second point regarding statement of change in equity will be dealt with where there is a retrospective change in retained earnings resulting from a change in an accounting policy or an error. But in general sense, a statement of changes in equity should present a reconciliation for each reserve. Each reserve should present what is the opening balance of the reserve, what is the addition to the reserve in the current year, what is the utilization or deduction from the reserve in the current year, and finally the closing balance of the reserve. Guys, your statement of changes in equity will predominantly be presented in this way. Your reconciliation statement will be presented more or less like this. SOC. Each reserve will become your heading. So sometimes I can have a securities premium. Or I can have a PNL, or I can have a general reserve or a capital reserve or my retained earnings, which is nothing but your PNL. And total. It should start with the opening balance of the reserves at the beginning of the year should be increased by additions during the year should be added with the additions during the year should be reduced by utilizations during the year and finally we'll come to closing balances this is a reconciliation statement which every enterprise has to present as a part of its statement of changes in equity. They will have to present each reserve's opening balance and their reconciliation to the closing balance where there is an addition during the year and there is a utilization. Remember under retained earnings, the additions during the year are generally in the form of total comprehensive incomes. TCI is an addition, utilization is in the form of dividend paid. along with CDT, Corporate Dividend Tax. This part of CDT we have already dealt under India's 12, where we said CDT though is a, is a charge against profit, it should not be presented in the statement of PNL, but it should be presented as an adjustment in other equity. So this is the adjustment in other equity where we record. Clear? So statement of changes in equity should include at least a total comprehensive income, should at least include the retrospective effect in retained earnings resulting from a change in accounting policy or errors in previous years and then the reconciliation of each reserve has to be presented where we start with the opening balance and derive the closing balance after adjusting the additions and utilizations during the year. What are the disclosures required as a part of your notes to accounts? In your notes to accounts, I should first start with an explicit unreserved statement of compliance to Indias, which we started the Indias one with. Apart from that, basic company's information should be provided. The company's name is so-and-so, incorporated under so-and-so, having a registered office at so-and-so, and closing its financial statements on 31st March or 31st December each year. So this is the basic company's information which has to be presented. Significant accounting policies adopted in preparation and presentation of financial statements also should be disclosed. 
the disclosure requirements as per any other NDAs like NDAs 24, NDAs 108. There are particular disclosures which have to be made and those disclosures as per the respective applicable NDAs also should be made as a part of your notes to accounts. Any additional disclosures can also be made as a part of notes to accounts to make the financial statements more reliable and more relevant. So I'm saying notes to accounts is not a compulsory limitation. You can have multiple more disclosures which will make the financial statements more reliable and more relevant. Remember, I'll always start with explicit unreserved statement of compliance to the NDAs applicable to the enterprise, then giving you the basic information regarding the company on when it was incorporated, what is its objectives and where is the registered office, what are the significant accounting policies it adopts in preparation and presentation of financial statements, any disclosures as required by the respective NDAs applicable to the enterprise. And apart from this, you can give some additional disclosures which you feel necessary will make the financial statements more reliable and more relevant. Clear? So this is my statement of changes in equity along with notes to accounts, disclosure required there. Always present your financial statements on comparative basis. That means your balance sheet, statement of profitability, cash flow statement, statement of change in equity should always be presented comparable from the current year to the previous year. However, your notes to account need not be prepared on a comparative basis. It is only the current year notes which has to be presented for. Clear? A comparative information is compulsory. You will see a different comparative when we talk about India's 34 interim financial statements. Under interim financial statements, there is a word called as year to date which comes up. So which is a, absolutely a different concept. But when I'm talking about India's one presentation of financial statements, which should be prepared at least once annually, in such case, the current year amounts should be compared with the previous year figures for balance sheets, statement of profitability, statement of cash flow, and statement of changes in equity. While the notes to accounts, need not be presented on comparative basis. Last year notes is unnecessary. Only the current year information should be presented in notes to accounts. The principles which we follow in preparation and presentation of financial statements. The concept of accrual, the concept of going concern. If there is a compliance to going concern, then there is no disclosures necessary. But in case there is a non-compliance, then your financial statement should be presented on liquidity basis balance sheet has to be presented under liquidity preference method. Along with that, you also have to disclose why the company has presented the financial statements on liquidity approach and what is the fact which has actually affected the going concern of the enterprise. Materiality is also a principle which we have to consider in presenting financial statements because you need to make the financial statements reliable and relevant. Relevant is what I'm talking about here. Relevant means all unnecessary small small uh, immaterial items should not be presented to make sure that the financial statements are way too elaborate and therefore it creates a lot of confusion. This same materiality concept has also been applied under India's 108. If the number of reportable segments there is no limitation but if it exceeds 10 then the management should understand what is the reasonability of the segments being reported. So therefore materiality is not just applied in India's one. It is also applied in other cases as well. When I talk about materiality, fundamentally two types of materiality will be coming. Quantitative materiality and qualitative material. An enterprise like Reliance having a turnover of four and a half lakh crores, four and a half lakh crores is a huge amount has a small item as winning from lottery for 1000 rupees. I round off in crores, then said the 1000 rupees became immaterial. Should I actually consider it as material? Yes, it should be considered as material. Though it is not quantitatively material, it is qualitatively material because the nature of transaction is not in line with the objectives of the enterprise. Clear? Quantitative materiality is based on the volume of the transaction while qualitative materiality is based on the nature of the transaction. Clear? Offsetting. Guys, this concept of offsetting comes in India's 12. Whether a deferred tax asset and a deferred tax liability can be offset. 
you will also get under financial state financial instruments where a financial asset and a financial liability can be offset remember whenever the concept of offsetting comes into picture the rules of offsetting are laid down very simple number one they should be legally enforceable for offset that means the asset and liability can be uh, uh, offset legally for example i have a defer tax asset emerging from unabsorbed depreciation i have a defer tax asset emerging from unabsorbed depreciation i have a defer tax liability related to a capital gain is it legally enforceable for set off can a capital gain defer tax liability be adjusted against unabsorbed depreciation under pgbp not possible therefore it is not legally enforceable for the defer tax asset and defer tax liability to be set off so therefore you cannot offset is legal enforceability the only condition no he said the entity intends to set intends to settle the items on net basis if the entity intends to offset the items and present it on net basis then only the enterprise can show so okay so accrual basis going concern materiality offset these are the four things that we have discussed as a part of principles in financial statements clear and that will bring us to the end of discussion on indias 1 where we talk about presentation of financial statements where the standard prescribes the basic minimum content of financial statements corporate enterprises should follow schedule 3 but any non corporate entity if it is adopting indias should present its financial statements in compliance to india swap clear